Huh. Hello and welcome to lot 49. Today I'm going to be rambling some more whilst walking through the woods. Uh, today's topics are uh, North Korean troops in Russia helping with the, the alleged, alleged North Korean troops helping uh, Russia with the retaking of the Kursk region. And the Israeli attack on Iran that was on the 26th of October. Right. Yes, so up to te it has been alleged that up to 10,000 North Korean troops have been sent to Russia's Kursk region to help repel the Ukrainian offensive in that area. The uh, Banderite incursion in the area. <coughs> um, these reports come from, these allegations come from Ukraine and I believe South Korea. Uh, now, given that Russia and North Korea have a mutual defence agreement, it's entirely possible that these troops are there helping the Russians defend against an invasion. But I don't think it's necessary for them to actually, I don't think it's, the, the Western narrative is that they is that Russia is so desperate for manpower that it needs these North Korean troops in order to survive and win. That is plainly false. However, I dare say a lot of uh, North Korean troops are in the are in Russia being trained in modern, the brand new uh, ways of war and in producing, um, developing some kind of uh, uh, mutual, uh, some kind of ability to work tactically with uh, Russian soldiers, since I doubt a lot of North Koreans know Russian and a lot of Russians probably don't know. Korean. So their forces would not normally be able to work together in any meaningful way on the battlefront. So I think there's, there's, there's an opportunity here for Russia to develop the skills of its allies in the region and it may also be a bit of um, uh, the, the, the North Korean soldiers may be there in Kursk to get some actual wartime experience, I would say. It's all very well training, but uh, sometimes you actually need to be out in the field with live ammunition being fired at you in order to test the military capabilities. I imagine against Ukrainian forces that are outgunned and poorly supplied. I imagine these are, this is probably the, the easiest fighting they'll, they'll, they'll get in the world. Um, but yes, a lot of these rumours come from, uh, there was a, there's a video of what look like Asian Asians in Russian military outfits uh, walking through uh, walking through a border area of Russia with a this is taken from the point of view of a cameraman who's sitting only slightly behind a piece of cover about 10 meters away from the supposed North Korean soldiers 
it has been also raised, the question, the point has also been raised that these may well have been uh, Russian soldiers. Russia is a very large country and some of the people, some of the ethnic groups in the east are obviously look more of an Asian appearance than they do of a Western appearance. Ooh. Now that I'm pretty sure was a not a sparrowhawk, a red kite. But I'm also pretty sure that the camera did not record that in any meaningful way, so you will not have seen it. Alright, um, but yes, this is probably also a western dis dis distraction, uh, just a bit of PR opportunity to make it look like they're, they're winning against the Russians. The point has also been raised that uh, the North Koreans just because there's a language gap, it means forces cannot operate alongside each other. Uh, if you ever watch any of the Patrick Lancaster videos, uh, he's an independent reporter on the front lines in the war. He operates on the Russian lines. I think if he went to the Ukrainian lines, he'd most certainly be killed. Um, He, a character which comes up every now and again is this Japanese guy who was uh, once upon a time special forces in the Japanese military or defense forces and then he when he signed up to join the Russians at the uh, beginning of special military operation or war, whatever you want to call it now um, yeah, the first time he talks to him, it's obvious that the, the Japanese guy doesn't doesn't really understand. He doesn't have very good Russian, and but they've worked out this. He and his the squad he's with have worked out this way of using. Um, they just they use special points on a map. Um, sort of like ha it's like military can military hand signals, um, something like that. But they have a, this rudimentary way of communicating with him on a, like a tactical level, which I suppose you need for all sorts of uh, military person-to-person -person interactions and just for a tactical basis, so you're not having to go through conversations all the time. Um, but he also uses one of these like Google Translate apps that uh, enables him to have conversations with those around him. I imagine, I don't think it's impossible for, for two forces of differing languages to coexist on the same battlefield, but you'd need sort of you need a robust um, command structure, I guess, that would be able to prevent limit friendly fire incidents. Anyway, uh, what next? Uh, yep, the Israeli attack on Iran, as I said, happened on 26th of October. Um, the, is, the Israelis sent I think it was up to a hundred aircraft, including some, I think it's like maybe possibly ten tanker aircraft out towards Israeli airspace, uh, not uh, towards Iranian airspace. Um, and fired off a load of missiles into Iran, most of which were appear to have been shot down. Um, uh, there seems to have been negligible damage in Iran itself. Uh, four service personnel are reported dead. 
and one civilian from the missile strike so some of them obviously landed uh, there is talk that um, the operation was going to be larger in scope and more destructive but they found that the Israelis found that the combined Iranian and Russian air defences in the country uh, drastically limited their uh, strike potential. They found too many of their, round, their missiles were so many of their missiles were shot down they weren't able to take out the targets they needed to progress. And they even said that um, it's even been mentioned that uh, the F-35s the Israelis were using were had even been uh, locked onto with radar systems, which is surprising. Well, not really surprising, but which is obviously worrying from their perspective because they're meant to be stealth aircraft that are meant to be invisible to radar systems. But obviously, assume the Russians, at the very least, have the ability to target these aircraft. It's entirely possible that it's thermal. I doubt the exhaust plume from a jet engine is. The aircraft itself may be invisible to radar, but it still leaves behind it a plume of heated gas, and which I'm sure they can, which can be tracked back. Anyway, uh, yep. Oh, and Iran has. It's questionable as to whether Iran has indicated that. That it will cont it will launch its own reprisal against the Israelis for this attack, and just how dangerous that will, just how intense that attack will be. But we shall see. Um, for now, though, uh, that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And until next time, have a good day.